All right, so let's talk about operability in Go. Um, a little bit about myself, I'm Ian Shank. I work at Oscar Health or Oscar Insurance. We're not really sure what it's called. Um, I work in infrastructure, which is under SRE, but I do a lot of software development as well. So a little bit more about me. I'm a SWE who keeps everything up in SRE, and I was just talking to this guy down here. Once you've done SRE, you just keep getting sucked back into that world. Um, but it's okay, I still, I get to spend about half my time writing code. Um, and one of the impacts or the effects of working in SRE is I have this constant pressure in the back of my head to write operable code. And what does that mean? That means when I'm looking at code, I think this is absolutely going to break at some point in the future. How do I make it as easy as possible? So what are operations? Um, if you use this GIF day to day at your job, then you're in operations. But what, I, what operations to me and what for the scope of this talk is going to be is basically maintenance and responding to failure in code. So we have this thing called the software design life cycle, um, if you're like old and remember this, which we've kind of taken one through five and squished them together with agile, right? But there's this number six, which is maintain. And the tricky thing about number six is that this is typically like almost always done by somebody who didn't write the code. Right? You might maintain some of your own code, but somewhere in your stack there's code you didn't write. And it's kind of, you know, boggles my mind that people don't think about this more, but hey, we're here today doing that. So maintenance. Um, even if your software is perfect and entirely bug free, it can still break. And I will give an example of that later, of a really crazy bug. Uh, environments are complex and changing, so your environment can break your code. Like if you just run out of space, boom, you know, run out of memory, boom. Uh, hardware can break. Hardware breaks all the time. It's a lesson we've sort of learned over the last 10 years. And humans are especially buggy. So when something fails, we have two equal objectives. Uh, one is fix it. Two is determine what went wrong. And I say these are equal objectives because, yes, you have to fix it, but determining what went wrong is very, very important. Um, so fixing it. Well, it kind of depends on the situation. I don't have a magic bullet for you. If something's broken, you've got to figure it out and fix it. But we can talk about failing well. Um, failing well. You want to fail immediately when an unrecoverable error occurs. You don't want to keep running in an inconsistent state. That's how you end up with data corruption. That's how you end up in an even worse situation. You want to fail the smallest execution unit necessary. Um, that's kind of a weird concept to describe. Um, where's My timer didn't start, by the way. OK. Just let me know if I go over. Um, that's, so like if, you're, if you have a service and you have service handlers, if it's possible to just fail the handler so that the whole service doesn't come down, then you could do that. It's totally fine. Um, but err on the side of caution. If you need to blow up the whole application, do it. In general, an unhandled or unrecoverable error should panic. Uh, this might be a little contentious, but I think it should. Uh, it should give clear and concise information about what led to the panic. So the panic's going to give you a stack trace, which tells you where in the code things went wrong. But you also want to add some more context. Um, so in Go, applications may panic, which will fail up to a deferred recover. I don't see a lot of deferred recovers day to day. In fact, I don't know if I've ever seen one. But you know, you could, for instance, panic an HTTP handler and fail up to the serving Go routine and keep going. So that's what I meant by fail the smallest execution unit necessary. Uh, panic without a recover just terminates the program. So panic does give you a stack trace but it could use a lot more context, right? So I highly recommend you add some logging around the context of what caused the panic, like what were the values at the time, what, was, you know, what were the inputs that caused this unrecoverable state. Um, so the second goal, determining what went wrong. This is really important, and I, you know, how many people here have, have had something break and you end up not being able to figure out what went wrong and you restart it. Yeah, that sucks, right? Like that's just, that's the worst. Uh, if you're unable to determine what went wrong, you can't avoid repeating the failure. So there's something called the five whys. You can look this up on Wikipedia. I stole their example um, for diagnosing failure. And it's this general rule of thumb that if you ask why five times, you can figure out the root cause. It might be less than five, it might be more than five, but the idea is to keep asking why until you get to the root cause. So with this example here, with the you know, dead battery, alternator not, broken, not functioning, the alternator belt was broken, the alternator belt wore out, the vehicle was not maintained. You get the whole way down to the root cause, which is actually, in this case, human error. 
which I think in operations a lot of times human error. So basically, if we're going to ask why five times, if we're going to diagnose a failure, we need a lot of information. This is what operability really boils down to. It boils down to information. How do you get information out of your process? Well, one thing you can do if you're dealing with a stuck process is you can use sig quit instead of kill dash 90 it. Um, and in Go, what this will do for you is dump out a stack trace of every Go routine, which is pretty cool. So you can see this, this application that I sig quit was just sitting there accepting TCP, just waiting. Um, so, what are, what, so then what are our sources of information? We can get a stack trace of a stuck process. And obviously there's logs. Um, we've all dealt with logs before. So the first thing I want to say about logging is provide context. Don't just log that print line error. Because there's a lot of errors in the Go standard library that will give you no context, like all of the errors in the IO package. Unexpected EOF. Unexpected EOF of what? Like, what was the file? Like, what was going on at the time? Um, a note on errors, though, some of them do provide context, which is really useful. So I kind of think about errors in Go in two classes. You either have an error that you test if it's nil or not, meaning success or failure, or you have named errors, like in I.O., which you can actually compare and branch and do flow control based on the error, besides just a Boolean value. So some errors do provide context, uh, which is good. Um, if you guys have never seen the errors package, um, it allows you to wrap context onto an error. I recommend it if you're going to be passing an error up. This is a place you can put context onto your error message so that it means something useful in a log. You can also add context with the logger. Um, so there's something called structured logging, and it's attaching key value pairs to your log. And uh, there's something called LogRS I recommend. That's what we use. And it allows you to just attach arbitrary key values. And this example is you know, your log message just started observing the beach, and that log message by itself would be very uninformative. But you add animal walrus number eight, and suddenly you know that there are eight walruses observing the beach. Um, this is sort of the output you get from from these things, uh, from LogRS. Um, what's really cool here is you have context in all these messages. And that's really what I really want to drill home here, is that logging should be action with context. The, cool, the other cool thing about structured loggers is they can output JSON, um, which might be tenuous with some people. But you can output text or JSON, which is really easy to consume using um, Logstash, Elkstack, Splunk. And context can make all the difference. So, so this, this is a real world example, this first line. Um, this was an error that was popping up in, at Oscar, all, like, not all the time, but every like month or so. It would pop up and it, it, we were like, why? How is the port already in use? How is the address already in use? Because we were binding, our code was absolutely correct. We were binding the port using SO reuse adder. All of our code uses SO reuse adder. There was nothing else like on that port that we knew of. And we couldn't figure out the problem. So after I collected about six of these error messages, I noticed that all of them were on ports over 32K. So has anybody figured it out yet? Yeah, outgoing TP TCP connections. Uh, and so you know, because we had that context there, we were able to figure out the error and fix it. So logging anxiety. Um, the anxiety over what to log, what is too much, what is too little. I was talking to this guy earlier, and he's like, you know, they, he doesn't like to see a whole bunch of log churn and dumping entire data structures out. So yeah, the, you, I think we've all probably experienced a little bit of anxiety over what to log and how much to log. So set that aside in your mind for now, because I have a solution. So what's some other information? Well, we have that stack trace. We have logs that are action with context, if you're doing it right. Um, what about the environment? Environment's pretty important, right? What about flag values? What about a stack trace? What about, I don't know, random variables uh, inside your program? So logging some of these may work, um, but maybe there's a better way. And logging doesn't work at all for some of these cases. Like, you're not going to log a stack trace every five seconds, right? So what about logging information outside of, or exposing information outside of logging? So logging describes action with context, and that's what logs are really good at. Well, there's something in the standard library called XVAR, which exposes current state. Um, 
XVAR, for better or for worse, adds a route to your default server mux at debug vars. And I think that's really unfortunate. Um, I don't like side effects in my code. I don't like weird side effects on import. But that's how it was written, and that's how it'll probably be for a while. Uh, in a recent, I think, Go 1.8, they finally exposed the handler so you can mount it wherever, which was like the happiest day for me. Um, it provides an arbitrary HTTP handler slash endpoint, um, you know, whatever you want to call it, which exposes arbitrary data in JSON format. And so what kind of data? Well, out of the box, if you just import XVAR, you get a command line and you get memstats. And it looks kind of like this. Um, I truncated that memstats object because it's like freaking huge. But you get your command line, which is a list of arguments. It's just os.args. Uh, and you get your memstats, which is pretty, some, it can be handy sometimes. Uh, if you want to learn more about memstats, there's a really, in the runtime package, there's a memstats object that like, documents every single field on that object. It's huge, so you, you have to just go look at it. But it has things like allocated bytes, your heap, sys, total. Um, it's got GC statistics, like how much time you spend in GC, how often you're spending time in GC, and then allocations by size. This, this um, unfortunately, isn't as useful as, um, as I'd hoped. <laughs> But it can be useful sometimes to try to figure out like what's going on. Uh, the one case where this was useful was Go doesn't tend to give memory back to the operating system, and I was a little confused there. And look, after looking at memstats, kind of made sense. So you can use XVAR to expose various var types. So there's a float, an int, a map, and a string. And the map can be a map of <coughs> string to string, or st string to float, or string to int. Um, and if you're Dealing with numerical types, you can have atomic operations for set and de increment, decrement. So those, those are pretty cool. You can use them as counters. But notably, there's this publish func. Um, there's this func type, var type. And right here, this is just straight out of xvar package. There's a command line, which is actually just a func command line. And memstats was just func memstats. So what does func do? Well, it publishes a function that returns an interface. And whatever that function returns, it's marshaled to JSON and sent out the wire. And this is, this is the memstats. This is actually the code straight out of XVAR. Um, that's all there is to it. So what else can you do with XVAR? It seems pretty cool. Well, you can publish the environment. Like that little one-liner right there will do it. Um, but os.environ gives you a list of strings. So you might want to map instead instead of a slice, so you could split it up and make a map. So what is this redact map here? I, I don't have the code for that. But what that is is if you guys, you probably pass in credentials or secrets through environment, you probably don't want to just leak them out. So I recommend writing something that redacts values. We just use regexes and a common prefix and redact them out. Um, you're you're going to want to filter the secret values somehow. and. In addition to redacting them, we hash the values so we can compare like, between services. Like, why is this service not working, but this one is? Well, you can go look at the secret value and compare the hash and know if you've got a wrong credential. Um, flag values can also be very useful for debugging. And if you notice here, I use visit all. So there's visit and there's visit all in the flag module. Visit visits all this, the, the, um, the set flags. The flags are set on command line. Visit all visits all of them. So I like to dump all of my flag values, even if they're using default values. And I like to flag magic values for two reasons. <clears throat> One, that means that later they can be changed. And two, they show up in XVAR, which is super useful. So if I was, you know, say I had a timeout value somewhere in my code, instead of just setting it to a constant, I would set it to a flag value. It shows up in XVAR, and I can change it later. Super handy. Um, stack trace. You could publish a stack trace. Go runtime lets you print out a stack trace into a buffer. 65K is probably too big, but you get the hint, you get the gist. Um, so this is super useful. Say you have a stuck process. Now you have an HTTP endpoint that you can hit and you can get a stack trace and you can see where it's stuck while it's running. Or if it's sitting there churning and you don't know what it's doing, you could hit this endpoint, get this stack trace a few times and see right into your process. So, you know, the first three, I would do this with like every program. In fact, at Oscar, we do this. Everything that runs exposes these things. Like, everything. Just right off the bat. That way, when something goes wrong, we can go look at it. Um, you can also publish your own things, and I encourage you to do so. So if you have large data structures in your code that you want to observe, just publish them. 
Um, a word of caution, though. <laughs> don't publish things that are super expensive. So, like, don't put a health check that does, like, a full table scan or something uh, in XFAR, because every time you hit it, it's going to do that. And at Oscar, we have, like, some scripts and some systems that hit these endpoints to do things. And they can hit them a lot. And yeah, you don't want to DOS your servers, your service or your job or whatever. Um, so use verbose names. This goes hand in hand now. So now we're up to the point where we're exposing values. We're exposing all this information. Use verbose names. So back to remember back what I said. It, it's the weird thing about maintenance is a lot of times the person maintaining the software didn't write it. So I might think XR published jobs makes a whole lot of sense. But the person who inherits the code and inherits the thing, they have no idea what, what, his, what his jobs mean. So use a verbose name, like discovery job cache. Um, the same goes for flag names. So if we're flagging more magic values and exposing the flags in XVAR, use nice, long, verbose names instead of like short names. This will also keep you from colliding with other flag values. Um, sort of the practice that we've been adopting recently has been to Use like the package path as the flag name up to the flag itself. The same goes for environment variables. So instead of DB password, maybe claims DB password. Um, instead of init timeout, maybe discovery init timeout. Just use nice, long, verbose names. So remember what I was talking about with log anxiety. Um, if you use these two things together, I think you get a lot less log anxiety. You're like, I don't need to constantly dump this huge data structure out into the log so I know what's going on. I can always hit XVAR and see the state, and log can be reserved for action. So if you're using XVAR, you've already committed to having an HTTP server in your service and open and responding to requests. Um, this becomes really useful. What else can you do with this? And just to run through, like, just give you a few ideas, you can put a health handler on this HTTP endpoint. You can put specialized handlers for libraries. So we use Vault for credentials at Oscar. Um, and we have a nice little endpoint where you can go in and see the leases, like see the length of the lease, the, how much lease is left. And there's even a button there for renew. So if a credential gets rolled, we can just go in and click renew. Um, we have, we use Aurora. Yeah, we're not on the Kubernetes train yet, but uh, we use Aurora. And Aurora has, you can set it up to interact with shutdown handlers, quit and abort. So we put them on there um, to interact with Aurora. And you can put admin handlers, which is something that's kind of new. Um, you can just have people put arbitrary pages up on it for interacting with the process. It's very useful. Um, a note on specialized endpoints. You probably only want to do modification or destruction on a post. You don't want to accidentally shut down a service um, because somebody pointed a web browser at an address. I'm not going to say much about monitoring. Um, which is a little weird because this is an operability talk. But I will say this, you should use Prometheus. <laughs> that's just like, I, that's, it is such a godsend and we are so happy since we switched to it. Uh, it's really fantastic. And if you know anything about Prometheus, it requires you to dangle an HTTP handler at some point. And well, since you have the status endpoint, this XBAR endpoint, you can dangle it right off, right next to that. Um, a special note to library developers, if you're a library developer, um, think about providing exported variables that give, if your library has internal state, think about exporting that in some kind of struct or some kind of variable so that an application developer who comes along and wants to use your library has the option of either exporting that stuff to Prometheus or into XVAR for more visibility. So to recap, um, I like to think about failure at all times and I use it to guide when to panic, uh, when to log, um, exposing data via XVAR. So if I find myself logging the same variable out all the time, I'll throw it in XVAR instead. Um, I think about logging in context. You know, if, you, if you're going to log an EOF, unexpected EOF, you probably want the file name in there or the connection or whatever it was. Um, and I think about naming a lot. So use nice, long, verbose names uh, for flags, environment variables, et cetera. And that's it. Thank you. Um, come talk to me about operations.